contextualizing of uh, the talk India Peer that uh, Shivaji is going to be giving in the Images of Encounter online photography exhibition. So I, I just want to start with saying that I was looking at every picture of the exhibition with a lot of interest. Uh, and in these times of the pandemic also with some longing. So both missing the standing in a room full of images and in particular the public places and the unfolding of lives there that these pictures were capturing. And in particular referring to the range of public places in Sunil Gupta's images titled at Mr. Malhotra's party. Right. And so I just want to say that for many queers and for many young queers that I am in touch with and perhaps economically privileged queers that uh, 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 that can work via the internet, the pandemic has, you know, meant a kind of herding back into the closet. So it's away from the queer community gatherings and into familial spaces that either disallow or violently prohibit their ways of living and relating. So virtual exhibition that includes queer photography and a discussion surrounding that, it's very, very welcome. And for now, a, what I would call a good enough counter public opportunity. So thank you for this. So I mentioned queer photography. I just want to first of all say that I'm neither an artist nor a scholar of the arts. I'm a psychologist and a teacher of psychology. But as I was swiping through the, you know, avowedly queer photographs, Sunil Gupta's and Deb Malia Ray Choudhury's in particular, I was thinking of what can count for queer photography. Okay, so I'd venture that one way to think of it would be that which captures the uncanny, right? Like this is not just what is strange, but that which is strangely familiar, you know, both familiar and strange. And then that, I mean, Shivaji can, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong as an artist and an art historian, but, you know, I think this strangely familiar makes it all the more troubling, queer art, you know, queer photography. So, and this troubling has then meant that for the audience, right, that this has historically translated to a systematic erasure and destruction of the lives and ways of, and the politics of queer humans. So in the, such a context, an archive of queer lives and politics, in particular social historical context, in both its pains and glories, is both very difficult and very important. So queer photography and more broadly queer archiving serves the purpose of showing how queer lives and queer experiences is populated by voices, moments, events that swell against this annihilating silencing and invisibilization. These images then become an opportunity to think critically about systems of oppression and the interlocking mechanisms of the personal and the political. Judith Hal uh, Halberstam, writing about transgender archives in, in a queer time and place, notes that the archive is, simply, is not simply a repository. It is also a theory of cultural relevance, a construction of collective memory, and a complex record of queer activity. In order for the archive to function, it requires users, interpreters, and cultural historians to wade through the material and piece together the jigsaw puzzle of queer history in the making. So, Professor, we are, you know, we have invited uh, uh, Professor Shivaji Panika for precisely this process, right? Like for this process of, like, you know, interpretation of, like, you know, some of these images in this in this exhibition, you know, contextualizing it in, like, you know, certain frameworks of meaning. So without further ado, I uh, invite uh, Professor Panike to deliver the talk. Okay, uh, Mamta, <clears throat> thank you very much. But uh, my uh, presentation is not about the exhibition. Uh, right. I was told that it is connecting to Sunil Gupta's uh, photography and art in general. Has, has, yeah. uh, it has uh, some images of Sunil, but uh, when um, uh, uh, the organizer, Abdul Kalam, uh, when he approached me, uh, he, I thought it was, uh, he was organizing a panel discussion. Then it turned out that I should give a talk. Then it was my responsibility to come to a, a topic. So, and I presume that there would be a lot of uh, uh, general audience. <clears throat> so I kind of uh, 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 kind of assembled a few slides and few ideas that uh, might uh, resonate with, um, you know, common audience. Uh, not in, in a sense, it's not a very specialized talk about queer art per se, but it also covers my favorite uh, theme of, uh, Queer theory on one hand, 
uh, queer activism on the other, and you have also queer, queer art. So a kind of a juncture of these three directions, you know, uh, if I'm able to engage with that uh, uh, and make some sense of it. Uh, but first of all, I should uh, thank uh, this organization uh, <coughs> for Abdul Kalam particularly for uh, inviting me. <coughs> and uh, it seems that I am the first speaker in this series. So that is, uh, uh, that is a special, that has a special place uh, that is given me. Thank you very much, uh, Abdul Kalam. And also Tulsi for all the administrative uh, work she had been doing in relation to this. Thank you very much. And uh, Mamta came to my imagination because uh, the organizers were not deciding on a moderator. So it was my idea that uh, I pull in uh, Mamta. I know, of course, uh, uh, she's not from art field, but uh, definitely she's somebody whom I have collaborated with uh, uh, with regard to queer. So we used to have a study circle and a, a core group organization, Ambedkar University, and we have worked together in many contexts uh, about uh, this particular theme. So I think uh, uh, Mamda would be the right person to kind of uh, moderate, interject, comment uh, on what I'm uh, planning to do. Now, with that uh, introduction, uh, I should straightway go into the presentation. Now, the title Cure India, uh, India Cure, is very cure enough, I feel. It doesn't specifically mean uh, a specific uh, thematic in that sense. I somehow tried to understand the relationship of India as a whole, India as a nation state, and uh, Cure. So, I begin my presentation from uh, from a uh, 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 certain legal background. Uh, this is a report uh, in Live Law on 13th September, that was just 10 days back. Uh, An IPL was, sorry, PIL was filed in Delhi High Court that seeks a declaration or, or recognizing the right of uh, same sex couples to get married, you know. So uh, this, uh, on the basis of the Hindu Marriage Act of 1925. So this news actually came uh, about. And um, shall I put it in the slide mode? Yeah, I yes. think that's better. So uh, the, the court uh, was uh, not very clear minded about what to decide. So the court urged the government to be open-minded. It actually referred the case back to the uh, government and the court reminded the government that the world around us is progressing. So be open-minded about uh, the decision or the, the recommendation. Uh, uh, and also suggested to the petitioner to attempt to register marriage in a registrar's office and came back to the court if the registration is denied, right? So uh, same-sex couples uh, uh, status for getting married. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, then the government of India representative Tushar Mehta opposed the pe petition, very strongly opposed, saying that LGBTQIA plus marriages are against Indian culture. Now, this is the kind of uh, touchstone of uh, all the, you know, politicians uh, who are conservative uh, to put the blame on the Indian culture or to put the entire onus upon the culture uh, the background. So, now this is in the background of the uh, more, uh, uh, clearer kind of recognition that came to LGBTQI uh, communities. First of all, the civil rights of the third sex or transgender hijra community was uh, civil rights were given uh, recently. Uh, further on, uh, section 377 of IPC, the uh, un unnatural clause was removed. These were kind of steps 
now this uh, 377 now this which is no more uh, you know uh, no more uh, what do you call applicable uh, said that uh, whoever voluntarily has cardinal, uh, cardinal intercourse uh, against the order of nature with any man woman or animal shall be punished with imprisonment of life now this is what actually was removed on 6th, 6th september uh, 2018 the supreme court of india ruled against that section so this is a kind of a, a major uh, achievement for the uh, lgbtq community uh, now that said it was not something very easy it was not something very easy easily arrived at almost two decades of uh, court cases uh, and to and fro you know the case was kind of transferred now so this actually gave a certain liberation to to communities uh, to public sphere like this is one example, the 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 metro line uh, metro station of Noida Sector 50 is renamed the Rainbow uh, Station after the 377 was uh, scrapped. So this is actually as recent as June 2020. Now 377 is very important because it allows uh, uh, individuals to engage in privately engage in sex, sexual activities in, un, in closed doors. But it, uh, uh, there is a long way to kind of uh, go. And this particular quote from the uh, Instagram, the law and the society continue to treat us as a second class citizens, but hey, happy Independence Day. This is the kind of common feeling that is reflected in this uh, you know, uh, post that I'm putting it out there. Now, this uh, actually takes us to a very important quote that I would like to kind of uh, 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 bring forth to you. That is uh, uh, by Michael Foucault, Michel Foucault. Uh, uh, I want to actually bring uh, a, a paradox in the situation that on one hand, the government has uh, decriminalized the uh, uh, queer sex. But at the same time, the government is so hesitant to accept the marriage. You know, that's the next stage that uh, queers have uh, uh, followed up. But uh, it is surprising to see that the government is still hesitant to accept the, the uh, social bondage uh, between social contract between two uh, 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 matching individuals. So Foucault actually says it's a long quote. I have uh, tried to kind of uh, shorten it. I will just uh, read it out here. I think what makes homosexuality disturbing, quote unquote disturbing, is the homosexual way of life, much more than the sexual act itself. This is a very important uh, statement that he comes up with. In comparison to what he's saying is that in comparison to sexual act, sexual act is less disturbing rather than homosexual way of life. That is way of life, we mean a social uh, life, you know, a life together. To imagine a sexual act that doesn't conform, this is a quote, to con imagine a sexual act that doesn't conf conform to law or nature is not what disturbs people. People are not really bothered. In fact, he says in the earlier uh, uh, you know, uh, sentence, uh, which I have not quoted here, that it's almost uh, aesthetic to think two women or two men uh, or two you know, same-sex people uh, engaging in sex is not so uh, unacceptable to the eyes, in the sense, to the aesthetics. But what is more disturbing, more structurally disturbing, is that individuals are beginning to love one another. That is a problem. If it is just a matter of sex, it is no much of a problem. The relation, these relations short circuit and introduce love where there is supposed to be law, rule, and uh, habit, he says. 
So a certain um, 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 uh, importance that one can give to social life in terms of making families, in making, making permanent relationships, adopting kids, uh, or inheritance law, etc., etc., uh, creates a lot of trouble for the patriarchy. Rather than accepting it's okay, pastime before guys get married, they have some uh, or girls get married, they have some uh, entertainment, you can say, you know. So, more serious affair of marriage is more troubling to the to the authorities to so there they ask for law rule and habit you know so uh, so that's that's one <clears throat> now so that is the first paradox that i would like to present that common uh, in perception in common perception uh, usual sex between two same sex uh, uh, lovers is not much of a problem but making an institution against a heteronormative uh, uh, is uh, very problematic. Now, the the view about the LGBTQ has goes through a certain uh, normative binary categories, you know, like conformity versus subver uh, subversion, or normal versus perversion. I'll come to some of these uh, ideas uh, as we go ahead. Compliance versus uh, resistance. These are some of the binaries that you find. Now, perversity or perverse is the most, uh, you know, uh, 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 what do you call a uh, most uh, 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 troubling kind of problem that you find in uh, understanding <coughs> by the common uh, public, not so much common public, but the authorities. Perversity is a negative value used against sexual minorities is very uh, obvious. It arises out of common sense notion. No, where does this uh, uh, negativity come from? Or idea of perverse, abnormal, perverse kind of category comes from is from the notion of uh, uh, normal and natural. So, because the heterosexist uh, sexual way of life seem to be normal and natural. Now, I would like to kind of juxtapose with this very, 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 very powerful image of uh, a two hands offering a, a heart, literally a heart. I don't know whether it's human or not, <laughs> but it's actually a, an image of heart, which comes to, which came to me through, uh, through WhatsApp. Some gay friend actually sent it to me, uh, saying, I love you. You know, so I mean, with this image, what I want to kind of uh, uh, point out is the fact that there is an excess in the LGBTQ world. There is a loudness. There is a kind of a uh, uh, almost that uh, that troubles the kind of uh, the the normal natural uh, perceptions. You know, so uh, the the community itself is very loud and very you know, assertive and they celebrate when they celebrate and they are tragic, it's tragic, you know. So kind of a melodrama is part of uh, 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 expression. Some of the expressions I'm saying, I'm not saying that is the kind of, I'm not, not, not universalizing, but this is the aspect which actually troubles the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, public perception. So perversity as such is, uh, a, 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 is said as a, a interpreted, we can interpret, we can see perversity when it is used, a, a, it is actually a sense of deliberate resistance to guidance and order of uh, heterosexist notions. So heterosexist notions uh, go uh, the life and the values of the LGBTQ go against the uh, established uh, notions of uh, so they read it as a kind of a resistance to guidance and order. Now and it reflects uh, the, the vicious injustice of naming no non heteronormative practices as perverse 
about uh, abnormal, unnatural, you're called de deviance or de deviation. Cujar is also a, a word that was used against such uh, people. Aberration is one, you know, another. Uh, so that it's uh, on the basis of this that uh, people were pushed to doctors to be cured or to the, to the quasi, you know, medicine men or for Jadu Chuktona, et cetera, et cetera. So people were sent to kind of, uh, you know, as uh, unnatural to be cured. And actually this, this kind of notions uh, reflect uh, the social stigmatization. There is the basis of social stigmatization are these perception of unnatural uh, perversity, cure, and uh, aberration, et cetera, et cetera. Now, on the other hand, the strategic uh, uh, position of the activism, you know, this is a very important essentialized, uh, essentialized approach of activism is that activism internalizes the stigma associated with abnormal or the so-called abnormal or so-called uh, unnatural or this so-called deviant and the queer and all these uh, negative terminologies, negative values are internalized by the uh, activists and get, uh, it gets used against the oppressed, oppressors and the, uh, and the uh, so it becomes a kind of, it becomes a strategy against the oppressor as a subversive transgressive strategy. Now, there are very many terms uh, in India in local colloquial or regional uh, languages use, you know, with regard to the LGBTQ uh, people. I'm not going to in, go, go into those uh, very derogatory uh, name calling. You know, one is Gandu, uh, very commonly kind of used. Uh, so in India, there is no such uh, approach to still use these uh, terms against the oppressor, uh, but we go, uh, by the international universal term like queer to, to express our. Now, this is actually based on uh, some kind of a theoretical position that uh, Michel Foucault had already put out. For him, queer, a term that indicates degradation originally has become, has been turned into affirmative set of meanings through uh, a, a, what he calls a speech act. You know, it's very important. This particular formulation is very important as far as uh, visual art is concerned. Uh, because uh, what actually visual artists are engaged in is, is what we can call as speech act. And Judith Butler actually called this move, this strategy of uh, using the derogatory sense uh, of the name calling uh, as this, this use of the of uh, the, the, the uh, name calling and reversing the, the kind of sense, uh, she calls it a radical resignification. It's very important uh, that the terminology that she uses actually uh, uh, brings in uh, that sense. Now, from here, actually, I would like to go, this is kind of a general idea of uh, the kind of uh, negative remarks uh, that an LGBTQ person receives from the society. And, uh, and also the resistance, the at least uh, 50 years of resistance, political resistance that has come about from LGBTQ community uh, has resulted in using this terminology against the uh, these uh, phobias. Now, uh, queer phobia itself is something that we need to kind of think about before we go into queer okay, phobia can be defined as the rational fear and aversion to or intolerance to non heterosexual orientations or practices or behavior, any of this. Now, this is very important that uh, in this, uh, it is taken for granted that heterosexuality is the only acceptable sexual orientation, which is absolutely ridiculous. So it is, it is basically a prejudice that, that is uh, adhered to by the heterosexual world. Uh, uh, 
which is comparable to racism or xenophobia or anti-Semitism or even Islamophobia. And also we can say that uh, it's a prejudice of structural patriarchy and sexism. This reflects uh, some kind of sexism. <laughs> now, it is also clear uh, from our experiences that queerphobia is experienced in ways ranging from simple jokes, very innocuous jokes, very simple uh, jokes to harassment and physical violence and many cases of killing of particularly transgender uh, people. So that is, uh, that is uh, uh, to be noted that it is not simply an attitude that is uh, uh, to be noted, but actual social practice of stigma and uh, uh, violence and also killing of uh, LGBTQI people. Now, I have a quote here of Nivedita Menon, who has written extensively on uh, sexualities. Uh, she says that the assumption is that normal sexual be behavior springs from uh, <clears throat> nature. And that it has nothing to do with culture or social history. That the, the assumption of name calling or queerphobia is that uh, the normal sexual behavior, the sex, heterosex sex, sexual behavior springs from nature, nature and it has, they don't see it as actually culturally oriented or socially oriented. <clears throat> but if we recognize that sexuality is located in culture and yeah. social, or social uh, upbringing, we have to deal with the uncomfortable idea that sexuality is a human construct and not something that happens naturally, quote unquote, naturally. So all the claims of naturalness to uh, heterosexual uh, uh, practices is baseless, including the gender as such today is uh, gender category of male and female itself is actually questioned. The kind of uh, the, the, the kind of uh, extreme division that exists in social and cultural practices. Uh, biologically uh, 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 and physiologically, there could be a lot of overlap in, in the uh, mixing of these uh, features of male and female. So <coughs> these assumptions are actually to be changed uh, if perceptions have to, uh, new perceptions have to come. Now I have a work of art here, which is not a very advertised or very well known artist. He was a photographer and a painter. His name is Ramesh Pitya. And uh, uh, his title of this work, and which he writes in the poster, is What is Your Perversion? So to a per the, per the society which calls you pervert, he is actually questioning back with this uh, uh, poster uh, and a photograph by asking this co counter question, what is your perversion? So this is a diptych uh, gauche on paper. Uh, it's a work of 2009, which is not actually exhibited anywhere. Uh, so <coughs> now with that, actually I uh, get into my next section, uh, which is a short section on the conservative claims and arguments of Indian culture. Uh, often it is quoted that great Indian culture that is against the, all this, uh, abnormal, unnatural behavior. But actually, if the evidence uh, goes against this claim. You just see some sculptures. Uh, this is often, of course, quoted often. I'm showing it again for, I, I could actually search out something new images. These are from Khajra uh, of 11th century. Uh, two men uh, in two, two sculptures are engaged in sexual uh, intimacy. There is another uh, uh, sculpture of lesbian couple in Khajarahu, uh, again, of 11th century. So all claims on uh, this uh, kind of uh, that uh, LGBTQ idea is something 
unknown or uh, non-existent and uh, imported from the West is totally baseless, totally baseless, which is also very evident in this book edited by Ruth Venita, Venita and Salim Kidwai in the book called Same Sex Love in India. It was as uh, long back, two, two decades back, 2001, it was published. But I don't know how much it is being used by uh, making for making argument. It kind of compiles all the evidences that exists about queer uh, interactions, queer relations, and queer life in the uh, ancient and medieval India. So those who want to actually kind of uh, get it clear in their head that and there's nothing unusual as far as cure, as far as India is concerned. There's nothing very secretly kind of uh, sacrosanct about non-European about uh, Indian culture as such. These are universal facts to be accepted. Now, <clears throat> it's also very interesting that if you talk to a very conservative right-wing person about uh, uh, that it existed in the past and it was part of Indian culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, they will come up with a, the, the defense that uh, now, well, we are talking about a contemporary modern Hinduism, in which it is not a, a, a admitted. Now, that's another totally another logic, right? Uh, uh, to consider that the so-called modern Hinduism, new modern Hinduism is actually something tailor-made after the intervention of the colonial uh, rulers, after the Victorian. So much of Indian stigma against LGBTQI uh, derives from the, the, the colonial period, uh, lawmakers. So that's very clearly evident. So Hoshang Machen, for instance, in his book in 1999, uh, he edited this first uh, anthology of Indian writing. You know, uh, uh, he discusses Indian responses to homosexuality and he calls it uh, shame culture rather than guilt culture. He makes a differentiation between <coughs> the uh, Judeo Christian Islamic uh, cultures, uh, which uh, uh, gives a certain guilt uh, and uh, then of course uh, 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 orientation or a reaction to uh, it's kind of God forbids such kind of uh, behavior. Uh, whereas Indian culture is uh, uh, even talking about the contemporary, you can say that it is uh, not about shame or uh, it's, sorry, it's not about guilt or punishment. Nobody is going to go to the hell because you are a uh, QR person, it is never mentioned anywhere, but it's actually a social uh, uh, shame because boys and girls are to kind of uh, supposed to make uh, families of the, with the with your heterosexual families, and anybody falling out of that uh, that that God that kind of uh, behavior causes shame. So uh, often you find people saying that you can do it, why not, you, if that is your interest, you can do it, but don't uh, speak it up. Why do you have to shout it from the uh, top of the, no, that may be okay with a lot of uh, uh, so-called MSM men, men having sex with men or women who are closeted, homosexual people, uh, but uh, they may live a double life, uh, or the, and they call, may call themselves a bisexuals. There is a category called bisexual. So comfortably they can hide behind that category. So this kind, this shame culture is a, it's a very more stronger determinant to to, uh, uh, to living kind of coming up with a something. Now I come to the crux of my presentation, which is uh, queer activism and high art practices. That is my uh, interest uh, in understanding the relationship between uh, queer activism, which is uh, not anything very new as far as Indian scene is concerned. Here also, it is something like uh, uh, 25 years or so we have, we can invest, of course, Euro American context, it's much longer. It's about 50 years of history. So uh, I'm talking about uh, high art making within the context of uh, to your activism. 
I had been trying to understand what the interrelationship between pure activism and art because it opens some kind of uh, anomalies, some kind of uh, dif difficulties in kind of accepting it as, it, as such. Now, my question is uh, how the mainstream art world accommodates, tolerate, or even make provision for acceptable, for the unacceptable through using certain strategies of appropriation, inclusion. So my question is actually, when large part of the society uh, is averse to this idea of alternative or cure life or cure, cure, cure culture, uh, how come art world has certain methods to accept this? They appropriate it, they include it, probably, probably also subsume it under the kind of uh, uh, practices. Now, <laughs> So there is, a, there is an interrelationship between cure activism and art, definitely. Now, I don't want to kind of say that completely uh, our art is elitist and so uh, they do not have any social value as such. But I would argue from the point of view uh, of what uh, Foucault would actually argue also, that uh, there is something like a speech act that a cure uh, artist is do, engaged in. So how do we understand this nature of uh, indistinguishable relationship, interrelation between activism and, uh, I will actually go into some of the details as we go ahead when we sum of the artists. Now, because I've, to my, to my mind, any queer speech act, speech act is actually from Foucault, so I'm using speech act uh, uh, arising within high art, high art because they are elitist art. It, it is actually for uh, that kind of society, smaller group, uh, seem to belong to activism because it has a certain relevance definitely to activism. Yet in actual practice, high art functions within the social sections of the elite class for various non-activist purposes. Because those who are actually dealing with uh, high art are not engaged in, so, in social activism or political activism. They are non-activists. Their purpose is actually uh, dealing with commodities, what the artists are producing and how to market them, how to frame them, how to put them up, how to sell them, how to kind of uh, create a, uh, a, a, a market for them. So, so as a result, uh, you can say that uh, the objects made as art does not actually prima facie become uh, socio-political activism because art is actually in a double bind, you can say. Art on one hand actually has a kind of a social discourse, but it has a much more stronger uh, 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 stronger, uh, what do you call, uh, daring with the uh, 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 gallery practices, art, private art practices. So you can't actually simply say that art objects made from an activist premise become prima facie uh, socio-political activism. Now, I straightway take you to one of the earliest uh, fine art makers, uh, Bhupen Khattar, uh, right from the Baroda uh, you know, uh, scene. He emerges uh, in early 80s as a gay painter, the first Indian, gay Indian painter to declare his sexuality through his art was, uh, uh, he was adequately exposed to West, particularly England, uh, he was in London for a period of time, just before his coming out. Plus, uh, socially also, his mother passed away uh, just before this. So he was relieved of all the kind of ties. Uh, and so he could actually paint some of the uh, coming out paintings in the 80s. Now, <coughs> it's very, very, very uh, important to see where he exhibited these works. He did not have the courage to exhibit it in uh, public galleries to begin with, not even private galleries. 
he actually secretively exhibited these for selected audience in spaces which are like offices, architect's office, etc. No, first time I saw these two men in Banaras was in Karan Grover's office in Baroda. It was a kind of a display that he had organized in the in the office. So for selected people. So he was very circumspect about the attack that can actually come from the you know homophobic uh, public, you know, especially political uh, people. It early eighties was still not so fearful one was, but still Hoopan was very careful. To, to exhibit these in a more circumspect manner. These two men in Banaras and Yayati, there's another painting, Yayati, are very outlandish. You can see two men, particularly the old man, old man and the young man. And this is a theme that is not dealt by many in, uh, uh, in a gay parlance also, you know, across gender, across age relationship. It could be a one night stand, it's a hookup probably, but to be open about it, his own old age. In fact, the old man is himself. There's a sort of certain autobiographical aspect about this painting. I won't go into the details of that. Probably this is not the place to kind of interpret the works. There is a man uh, prostrating in front of uh, Shivalinga. Now Shivalinga can be, of course, it's a sexual uh, image, very, and it's a sacred place like Banaras. So he has always kind of visualized uh, sexual acts happening in uh, religious uh, contexts. So kind of religious sanction is there. It's actually, I want to say that uh, Bhupen Ghakkar experienced a certain relief, experienced a certain, uh, you know, great uh, uh, relief in declaring himself or coming out as a gay man. And it, it is best reflected in his creativity because since 80s, his works have been so uh, unabashedly uh, ironical, complex, and uh, very playful. Uh, so this is an old man from Vasad who had five penises. Now, interpretation of it is not so simple. I can go on for a lecture, full uh, lecture in kind of talking about this particular work. There could be many, many. He himself was not very explain, giving explanation to this. Uh, perhaps it represents kind of, a, kind of a mythical aspect of sexual power, you know, certain uh, top men particularly. But then he also used the kind of a, kind of a, uh, what do you call a head cover for this man. So also kind of bringing in the aspect of the dupatta or the kind of uh, head cover used by a female. So he combines both this macho man as well as the kind of feminine in, in this one particular. Now, this is another uh, ironical uh, are his paintings. Uh, uh, how many hands do I need to declare my love to you? Is the painting that the watercolor of 1994. That is why I actually meant that he uses religious symbols like multi, multiple hands, but he's very, 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 very shrewd not to get into the, you know, irk of the, the right-wingers, you know, BJP fellows that he's using. But of course there are imagery that uh, Rama opening his uh, chest and no, Hanuman opening his chest and Ram sitting there in a, in a gay context, he picturizes. But then that is not actually allowed to be exhibited in India, in, in India anywhere because of the fear of uh, kind of wrath from the right wingers. Now, this is the most ironical work by him, uh, 30th wedding anniversary, their 30th picture taken in their 30th wedding anniversary, a uh, man and a man. Uh, one dressed up as a you know bottom, and uh, he he is holding the uh, penis of the man. So uh, so uh, Bhupendra had been most outrageous and outspoken about his sexuality, and somehow he managed not to get the court 
now look at this painting very openly kind of engaged in oral sex uh, uh, one is titled as orgy the colored one is orgy the other is intimacy he calls this intimacy uh, ironically it is called intimacy but there is just a, a carnal sexual pleasure that is uh, Upen Kakar is something somebody who needs more complex analysis more detailed analysis i won't attempt it here but i just uh, wanted to mark that he is the first indian gay painter to have come out and upan gakkar is very important because he never accepted himself as an activist he always shied away from uh, being an activist and but the impact of his works are seen in the activist field very very strongly uh, that is what i i mean it gave uh, courage to a lot of people a lot of youngsters including me to come out and uh, you know to speak up so this happened actually in the 80s as far as we are concerned 70s were a, were, was a dark period 60s 70s had been a dark period where many people could not really speak up so from 80s onwards you actually see and it took uh, 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 another decade 1997 this was the most bold and sumptuous and taboo breaking is the title that is given to fire now because it is banned in india it was shown it is a poster that was actually put up in us uh, it's a film by deepa mehta of uh, uh, two women's love uh, in a kind of a dysfunctional family and the expressions of these women are very telling of the content of being now i like the title uh, it says bold sumptuous and taboo breaking so there is a kind of a kind of a uh, uh, pleasure in kind of coming out and opening it out and kind of uh, speaking it up you know uh, now another very important uh, landmark uh, film was uh, 2004 2005 um, uh, cinema, uh, film called my brother nikhil which was the first uh, gay movie i would say outright uh, thematic of a gay man uh, who was uh, infected by hiv aids and the first hiv case in goa and it's biographical and it's a very touching very very moving uh, narration by onir the filmmaker only so these are kind of landmark so i actually covered some publications you have seen late 90s early 2000s uh, some films so that these are actually kind of period of breaking you know Uh, barriers coming out and talking of course you have commercials like uh, dostana 2008 which makes it uh, comedy and which makes it entertainment and it's nice to imagine uh, bishek bachchan and uh, john abraham to maskula macho guys uh, imagine having sexual relation but then they it turns out to be that they're pretending that for certain other purposes etc etc so hide and seek is very much clear as far as uh, uh, bollywood is concerned you know very good example is karan johar so it doesn't actually suit uh, the many people to do i would actually argue that uh, the bombay film industry is a very heterosexist uh, uh, place it doesn't give uh, much of uh, value for a gay man now please look at these two um, uh, publications that came out in 1990 this were the two first i mean supposed to be first publication until somebody else comes up with something else so in the late 80s uh, the, the the activist uh, 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 groups were actually collective momentum this is hum safar trust bringing out bombay dost in, uh, in the late uh, 80s and this actually became very 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 important and this kind of sold in the market like uh, hot cakes and it kind of brought together a community in bombay and which actually becomes a kind of a, i suppose the first uh, ever a gay more, more formal gay group in india but there could be other informal gay groups 
uh, elsewhere. Now, of course, you know the history of the, or we need more further time to kind of talk about history of uh, activism in India. Uh, uh, pure pride is actually one major, and your publications are another, uh, which carry a lot of value, meaning for the people in the community that gives them a kind of an identity and a platform to speak up and come together. Now, these are some of these one scene just to kind of uh, give an idea of that, uh, <clears throat> uh, which the poster says, kiss me, I am pure. Now, the, the top part of the poster is lost, I'm sorry. Uh, it says, homo hate BJP. Now, I just uh, kind of uh, took it because it's also my colleague who is holding the um, Akhil Katyal, who is a very well-known uh, poet also. And he has also written a theoretical book on uh, gay. So it's an old picture uh, of Bomb, uh, Delhi Pure Pride. Homo hate BJP is uh, one poster which caught my attention in, in that. Another is this uh, imagining Amit Shah and uh, Modi having a kind of an affair. You know, it's a kind of a curing. What do you what do you call a curing of Indian politics or Indian uh, people? So uh, uh, this is a 2013 uh, poster uh, of I love Amit Shah kind of poster, just for a kind of a. Now, coming to kind of more serious uh, affair of uh, art making. Now, uh, Pupin was uh, somebody who belonged to a kind of a, uh, 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 period of uh, art practice, which do not really want to identify with activism because they thought that activism somehow takes out that aesthetics from them. Whereas a uh, number of contemporary artists today do not actually hesitate themselves to call as activists. One is Sunil Gupta. He had a kind of a non-resident Indian uh, orientation. He was in Canada, America, and also in London. So that gave him a kind of an international kind of bearing. And, but of course, he came to India to live for about 10 years or a little more. Uh, early 2000, uh, uh, probably. That's when actually he has made that this photograph which he has exhibited in this particular show, right? So he, it was his habit to kind of, it was his uh, project to kind of uh, uh, photograph uh, gay couples. And here we have uh, such a, a early uh, edition, a, a early, uh, uh, group of works by him, 1984-85. Uh, you can see the intimacy, you can see uh, openness about exhibition, exhibiting their bodies. So, but uh, compared to Gupta, naturally the, it calls for a comparison. Uh, Gupta never becomes that outlandish, never speaks up in that sense to kind of uh, trouble. Even then he actually gets into trouble that we'll come to later, the homo homophobic trouble. These are very decent uh, couples, uh, hand in hand and body to body, very intimate couples that actually he has come across, he's probably his, uh, close associates. Uh, 84, 85 is the date of this. Um, now he himself uh, presents him uh, in nude. This one rare photograph of performing uh, photograph by Sunil Gupta. I'm sorry, the photograph is not very clear. It's a little out of focus in this uh, case, which is juxtaposed to a Ladakh landscape. No, probably kind of juxtaposing that the, the, uh, gives you meaning of kind of a kind of light and you know kind of a freedom and a kind of you know openness about it's kind of a liberational kind of statement that comes through in this painting. Right, so uh, this is Sunil Gupta again, as I said, uh, very rare photograph. He doesn't do regularly, he doesn't engage in this kind of uh, uh, performative photographs. Now, this is the kind of, uh, sorry, this is the group of work uh, that actually got into trouble. 
in uh, 2012, uh, which he had put up in Alliance, France, and Delhi. It was closed ab abruptly due to intimidation from police, <coughs> quoting violation of uh, Section 292, that is IPC obscenity, obscene content and disobedience to order duly promulgated by the uh, government servant. So police uh, order he did not promulgate or kind of accept. So now this group of paintings, he explored gay life. Um, he, it, it actually uh, uh, featured 16 colored pictures, uh, uh, he, which he took in France uh, 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 in, uh, in 2010. The, uh, uh, the project involved a fictional narrative loosely based on the French uh, science fiction. Uh, so it's a kind of a fictional uh, narrative uh, uh, of an Indian guy uh, here going into a kind of a French, uh, what do you call it? Uh, French uh, bath? Sauna? Uh, what do you call it? Yes. So his alienation there, his strangeness there, he's sitting there. Uh, but he, he get, how he gets engaged with uh, kind of uh, sexual act. So the guy who is kind of bending down is uh, involved in some kind of act. That so uh, Sunil is not very. Uh, he's not kind of open it out so totally. You know, in that sense, he's not taking that kind of vicarious pleasure of sexuality. He's not kind of denying that kind of thing. Now, another artist uh, of significance who is also claiming activism, like uh, uh, Sunil Gupta, is Jahangir Jani. In fact, Jani is an untrained artist who is uh, uh, associated with uh, Bombay, um, you know, uh, activist scene, Bombay uh, Hamsava Trust. And he begins to kind of paint and start sculpture after 1995. So this is a 2000 uh, 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 sculpture, which is called Agni. He had been concerned about the pains and uh, trepidations of the Kothi, the Indian parlance, Kothi, the bottom, uh, the effeminate male uh, um, guy. So uh, this is called uh, this watercolor by Jani called Sahmat uh, Olympus, because Olympia is always represented as a female. So he tries to represent a boy in the place of the Olympia. So it is Sahmat, he probably did it for Sahmat, you know, Sabda Ashmi Memorial Trust. Now, this one particular work I personally like is in plaster. This is called Pink Sun. This is a portrait of a Kothi or a bottom. Uh, in the in the night scene, that's why the the, the kind of uh, neon lights that are uh, like sun, giving it a kind of sun. But the very importantly, the kind of body movement of the figure is very much like the kind of uh, the swings of the of the effeminate male body. It could be also a transgender body, you know. So very observant and. Uh, now, I'm not actually going into the details of what uh, uh, <clears throat> Jani has gone through. His works were also confiscated, which was asked to kind of close down. He was also faced with, like Sunil, he was also faced with uh, troubles in Bombay when he exhibited, uh, perhaps, I think it was in 2015. So those images I'm not bringing in because I'm not talking necessarily about homophobia and art. Uh, now, this is another very important young artist called Belbir Krishnan. Uh, <clears throat> this is, was from his uh, first exhibition, which was literally attacked and he himself was manhandled in, uh, in 2012 or 13 in uh, Lalitkala Academy Gallery. Uh, it was uh, uh, trashed and the exhibition was uh, kind of thrown around and broken and he was abused uh, uh, as such a kind of a, this uh, differently abled person, Balbir uh, Krishnan. Uh, of course, his sexuality, sexual representation, as you can see here, was very obvious at that time. 
But later on, he has actually kind of contained himself and uh, has kind of withdrawn. So a lot of self-editing, self, -editing, self um, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> that happens. Now, this is also an unpublished, probably a, a photograph by Inder Selim. Inder Selim's more, uh, more well-known works are his uh, performative acts. Uh, uh, but this happens to be a photograph. It is called as yesterday evening when I had almost nothing to do. Uh, this is the title of the work. So he sits on a, on a pestle, uh, probably to, uh, uh, and all gives a kind of sacred look to it by having the plastic flowers around it. Uh, another work uh, by Indar Salim is called uh, The Ink for the White of My Eyes. Now, this is very, very, very uh, auto-referential, you can say, self-referential. Uh, some of this aspect of uh, work that I want to kind of bring in, this is my very short, brief uh, 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 sharing with you, my concern of uh, what exactly is the self-expression of a queer person. Is something that that vents his or her frustration often or it takes out his desires his expressions in in a kind of a body art to the extent of making it making the uh, heart over his own uh, sexual organ you know and then photographing it and then sharing it you know i find it very very curious to engage with. Uh, something like what you find on the walls of the train in, uh, bathrooms, the, the uh, you know, uh, or toilets, you know, some kind of venting of the, so I want to end my presentation. Uh, it took one hour or so with uh, this, uh, you know, failed, uh, Cure intervention in Ambedkar University, where Mamta and I taught together. We were also engaged in the discussion about it. This is uh, called. This was called as Museum of Desires. This was in the process of making. This is a kind of a space that is in the corridor. Uh, it is a squarish kind of very odd kind of space, uh, uh, connecting two corridors, and uh, some. Curious students in the campus got into this room and started painting this. Both both girls and as well as boys uh, involved in it. So this girl was representing the pleasure of or pain of the menstruation. Actually, it is this photograph is in the process. Otherwise, you see the menstrual blood coming out of her vagina. Uh, so it had it. The room was almost filled with various kinds of sexual imagery that you are actually you usually draw it on your uh, you know uh, body on private parts or private notebook or on the or on the you know uh, you know toilets and stuff public places or something like that you know so here. It is, uh, it was, the students had decided to kind of bring it out in public in terms of a discussion for a discursive practice, you know, uh, taking it a kind of a chance for, for the kind of uh, suppressed uh, uh, libidinal energies to kind of, so these are um, other two pictures of this. Uh, uh, the, the, actually, these are not representative. I have not got the best of it. Now, walls were also written down with very many things like uh, sexy is not dirty, beyond the trinity of breasts and the forest of pubic hair. The space is your, uh, your space, color it with your fantasies. This is a kind of, a, you can see this, uh, uh, this space is your space space, fill it with your desires, sexualize this space, it's yours, use it for um, uh, bringing, bringing out your libidinal transgress openly, this is your color, it, it is with your imagination, use all the colors, all the spe spectrum of the libidure, and it, this is your space to be 
etc etc so this was very liberational but soon the authorities uh, uh, within no time almost two hours or one hour uh, as soon as it re reached the uh, ears of the authorities it was decided that it should be demolished it doesn't have the right to exist it was aborted the child cannot take birth so in a way it is very symptomatic of the homophobia that i was talking about uh, very symptomatic of our times the queer phobia that we find people who erased it will not accept that they are phobic they will say that oh, we we don't have any problem because we belong to academic world and pretentiously also we we are very queer friendly they will say but when it comes to their uh, actual you know testing they will st they'll stand against you uh, well i mean i have a personal uh, anecdote related to that but i won't go into that you know here this was something very very uh, it's determined somewhat my role in aud uh, ambedkar university but i won't actually kind of speak about it at this context now uh, i lent with my heart open from my friend <laughs> and somehow this uh, image since i got it it kind of uh, haunts me there's a kind of honesty with which one expresses the artist who expresses it immediately kind of uh, uh, you know annihilated closed it's like father shut up you cannot so talk about it kind of thing it's kind of beyond the scope of uh, public discourse. So I thank you for this uh, precious opportunity, ETP, for uh, giving me a chance to kind of speak in this forum. And I hope uh, uh, Mamata will uh, say a few things and then probably we'll, there can be also question and discussion. Uh, thanks so much, Shivaji. Um, uh, I could speak a few things, but I just want to ask Tulsi if we should open the floor for uh, uh, discussion because we are 6.20 now. I, th I thought it was like, you know, by 6 o'clock, 6.05 that we thought we will finish. Maybe I can say like a, two lines and then open the floor for like questions, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 thanks. Do you like to... Uh... You, you can take a few more, few more minutes also to sum up because, uh, and then we can open the floor. It's all okay, okay if it extends by another 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, um, uh, though my introduction was to your talk, Shivaji was focusing on photography, right? Like the, I, 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 what I'm seeing is that like, you know, a common theme that was running in your, uh, in your presentation was this, question of queer visual expression, queer art, right? As well as like, you know, the question of like, you know, like politics and uh, resistance through these. And uh, uh, I mean, that could, that could be traced right from, you know, how you are contextualizing, right? Uh, um, um, uh, these debates in, you know, in India, in like, you know, in the decriminalization uh, 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 in law and the limits of that, the expressions that you see on the, you know, the visual expressions that you see in the metro, but at the same time, like, you know, the limits of like the freedom that is conferred by that law that you observed, right? Um, uh, uh, then you like examine the question of the normal and the perverse, right? And you talked about like, you know, how queer expression is, is, is sort of in your face. It's an assertion. It's like a confrontation, like, you know, a, 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 you know, a prideful, like, you know, like sort of,